Okay, good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you for joining me on this uh, great day. And I'm Louise Rance, and I'm going to be going through how to manage conflict in the workplace. So to tell you a bit about ourselves, I'm part of a company called Clover HR. We're an outsourced HR company and we are your trusted people advisors. So we're here to help you in any way you can, whether you're a standalone HR manager or a business um, that doesn't have its own HR function. We're here to help you um, with all aspects of HR. Between us on the team, we've got over 150 years of experience so we can ensure that you get the best advice and service that we can give. The photograph that you can see there was taken last March and there's a few uh, more of us have joined the team since then. Obviously, like a lot of other companies, we've not been able to get together physically. We've been having virtual meetings, but as soon as we can all get together, we, we will take a, another group photograph. Uh, between us, we've got 150 years of experience so we can ensure we give you the best advice and service. We all have our specialisms, uh, which run from recruitment, training, coaching, well-being, rewards, mediation, and many other people's strategies. So to tell you a bit about myself, my name, as I said, is Louise Rance. I'm a HR business partner and a workplace mediator. That's my particular specialism. And those are my contact details there. So uh, Q&A, you do have a Q&A button, so you can ask me questions through the webinar. I'll probably take them at the end, just so it keeps the, the flow going, but you can also use the chat button. Hopefully at the end, we'll have time for a bit of an open forum where we can, uh, you can ask me any questions that you want to. We'll just see how the time goes. At the moment, I've got your microphones muted. That's just to help the flow of the webinar. I will uh, unmute your microphones at the end. So this is what we're going to go through today. So obviously we're looking at um, conflict. So we'll look at what is conflict, a definition of conflict. We're then gonna look at conflict management styles, whether we know it or not, we've all got our own particular style of managing conflict. And I'll take you through what those styles are and you might be able to spot yourself or others within those styles. We're going to examine the causes of conflict. Um, conflict, what do I do about it? So uh, techniques for managing conflict uh, constructively and then handy hints for managers in managing conflict. And then we're gonna look at creating a culture uh, which includes conflict management, how you can work that into your structures. We'll do a summary and then a quick Q&A at the end. So let's have a look at definition of what is conflict. So the first point to make is that conflict is a normal and natural and pretty well inevitable part of working life. And it can be constructive, but it can also be destructive. But this is a definition that I've taken from David Little, who is from TCM, who is a, a conflict uh, expert. And as you can read there, so conflict occurs when an individual or a group of individuals believe that another individual or group of individuals is preventing them from achieving their needs and goals. And that can be preventing access to resources that they need, which could be staff, could be finance, uh, preventing them from expressing their values or beliefs. Um, and our actions and, and reactions to that determine whether the conflict becomes and remains constructive or whether it becomes destructive. So let's have a look at some management styles. So um, there was a, a, a survey done that was actually in, in uh, 1974 by uh, two workplace psychologists called Kilman and Thomas. And they identified five styles that people adopt when in conflict. These ways of managing conflict are ways that we have learned, uh, possibly not consciously, but we have learned from childhood or from the connections that we've had with other people or colleagues. And the two main factors that govern the way we deal with conflict 
are um, our personal goals. So how important or unimportant is, is, is it to us to achieve our own personal goals? And the second aspect is how important or unimportant do we view relationships with other people, uh, possibly in respect to those goals? So if we look at, first of all at shark, so somebody who is acting with a shark way of dealing with conflict, the main importance to them is that they achieve their goals pretty well at all cost and relationships to them are nowhere near as important as that. And they will achieve their goals by forcing, uh, by intim intimidation sometimes, um, by um, forcing who they see of their opponents into uh, a position where they will concede with, with what somebody that's in a shark uh, mode actually wants to achieve. So they may attack and intimidate others and, and you may see this uh, in the workplace. Somebody who is adopting a turtle way of dealing with conflict, uh, to them, they find conflict very difficult to deal with and they will avoid it at all costs. So somebody that has, has this style of dealing with conflict will try and withdraw from the conflict. They will adopt a more I lose you win position. And when I say withdraw, they may withdraw from a, a, a discussion that's becoming heated. Uh, they may go silent in a meeting where they're observing conflict. And ultimately, if they're experiencing conflict in the workplace, they might even leave the workplace um, because they, they really don't want to deal with conflict. They find it too uncomfortable. Uh, somebody that is um, using a fox way of dealing with conflict, they will try and seek the middle ground. So they're moderately concerned with achieving their goals and they're moderately concerned with maintaining their relationships. They will give up part of their own goal um, and try and get the other person to maybe give up part of their own goal so that they can achieve a compromise. And then if we move on to uh, the teddy bear. So somebody that's acting in, in a teddy bear style of conflict, uh, to, a to somebody in this style, relationships are really, really important, more important than achieving their own goals. They want to work in a harmonious work environment. And if that means that they have to give up uh, some of the goals they want to achieve, then that's, that's what they'll do you'll see people that are in this mode trying to smooth things over, um, tr trying to avoid conflict. And then we move on to the owl. So somebody that's in an owl uh, style of conflict, they actually can see conflict, that ca it can be a positive thing. It can mean that relationships are strengthened if the conflict is handled in a constructive way. Um, they look to achieve their own goals, but they also look to try and help other people achieve theirs. And so they're in the collaborate and cooperate mode. They're looking for a win-win for both sides. And actually what we want is for more of our managers in the workplace to adopt more of an owl style of managing conflict. So hopefully within those styles, you can spot perhaps where you are in that particular style or, or certainly where other, other people are. So then moving on to look at the causes of conflict. Um, just to talk about how widespread conflict actually is, the CIPD did a report in January 2020, uh, which is entitled Managing Conflict in the Modern Workplace. And they found from a survey of employees that 35% of the people that they surveyed had experienced in the last year interpersonal conflict at work. So this is an issue that is, is spread amongst workplaces. And so the causes of conflict, relationship breakdown, this is probably the chief cause of conflict. And this can happen when communications break down between two parties. 
it can be something as simple as a conversation taking place in a noisy work environment where actually somebody misunderstands what's been said to them. And this can happen if, we, if you're using visual, uh, virtual means of communication, which a lot of us are at the moment, that we don't always pick up on those subtle cues uh, that give us the full picture. So it's uh, often a, a result of misunderstanding. It can happen uh, if, a man if there are uh, performance or competence issues that a manager is trying to deal with. And if the relationship isn't one that's been built of, of trust and communication, then that can lead to a relationship breakdown and possibly claims of harassment and bullying if, if the right approach hasn't been used. Then moving on to poorly defined job roles and unclear objectives. So when we start a job role, we might start with a, a job description and a, and a knowledge of what the job role is that's been portrayed to us. And then as time goes on in the job roles, because we, we work in dynamic environments, the job role may change and, and so might the objectives. So it might be that somebody is, is working a job role and they think they know what the requirements of the role are and what are the key priorities. But actually, if there's not the ongoing communication with their manager, um, then the manager might have a different idea about that. Or it might be that in the workplace, uh, I've got an idea about um, the job role that Andler is. She should be doing this, that and the other. And actually, that's not her uh, idea of her job role. So poorly defined job roles and unclear objectives. Managers who lack competence to manage conflict, particularly in the early stages. This is not a criticism of managers. Um, when you look at CIPD studies, only a third of managers in our workplaces have actually undergone any kind of management training, let alone uh, training in how to manage conflict. So some managers just don't feel confident in tackling it. They either hope that something will solve itself and go away, or they don't see it as their role. It, you know, it's HR roles, it's the owner's role, it's somebody else's role to manage this. And particularly in the early stages, if we can identify and take action in conflict that we observe in the early stages, it hopefully prevents it from escalating to a point where it's much more difficult to achieve that kind of intervention. And then change processes and revise working practices. As I said, we, we work in a dynamic work environment. Things are changing all the time. And sometimes if there's not the communication about those changes and why they've been brought in and what they are, that can be a cause of conflict. I think we've probably all worked somewhere where, where somebody will say to us, well, it was much better before. Um, it was much better before we, we had to do what we, we had to change the way we work. And then a clashes between individuals about task completion, personal values, goals or expectations. So again, this can be about task completion, how it's done, when it's done, to what standard it's done. Personal values, we've all got our own worldview and things that we value. Uh, we all have our own goals, both personal and work goals and expectations. And obviously they don't always marry together. So that's some of the picture of conflict. So conflict, what do I do? What, what steps can you take to, to manage conflict? So it's useful here to recognize what happens to somebody, what happens to all of us when we are responding to conflict. So conflict does trick us into behaving badly and there are reasons for that. So when we're under threat, then the stress response is triggered, which I'm sure a lot of you will, will have come across. Neurotransmitters in the brain are activated that create this stress response and it can happen very, very quickly. And this stress response is one of flight, uh, fight, freeze or fall. So what's happening here, our, our, under stress, our bodies are being flooded with adrenaline and cortisone. And, and that makes it more difficult for us to think rationally. And, and the reason for that is because um, our ancestors, if they were faced with a physical threat, like running away from a saber toothed tiger, then their body would prepare them to do that, to, to fight it or run away from it or to hide from it, to freeze. Um, 
And we still have those same those physiological systems now, but we're in a different environment. So we can't always run away if we're in the middle of a heated meeting. Um, we, we, we can't always um, get rid of that adrenaline by physical activity. So what we want to try and do if, if uh, people are in, in this conflict is try and move them into a flow response. Um, with the belief that both parties that are in conflict matter. So the fight response is, is one of, I win, you lose, probably going back a bit to the, to the shark way of dealing with things, belief being that you don't matter. The flight response is, well, I'm, I'm gonna run away, I, I'm gonna give up my goals, uh, I lose, you win, um, belief being that I don't matter. The problem with that to some uh, somebody that adopts that response is that it can have quite a, a devastating effect on their self-esteem eventually. So what we want to try and do to try and, and bring people away from this emotional response that's going on is to uh, look to diffuse uh, the aggressive situation. So we want to get people into an adult to adult conversation and the way that we do that is by asking them uh, factual questions so we would ask them things like um can you tell me about what's just happened uh how are you feeling about it what do you need to change um so if for instance you're in the workplace and you observe two people that have been in conflict is, is make time to speak to them in a private space individually to have this conversation. And in doing that sort of conversation, we're encouraging the flow of dialogue, we're demonstrating uh, empathy, and we're encouraging mutual respect with a flow of ideas and a flow of trust. And this flow reduces those levels of cortisol and increases the level of engagement. And in a flow state, we can achieve our mutual needs. So you're looking to have an honest conversation and point out observable behavior. So again, if you've observed two people in conflict, perhaps in the workplace, um, observe what you saw back to them, what you possibly overheard. Um, and in, again, you're keeping it on a factual adult to adult level. And remembering that all conflict ultimately stems, stems from loss perceived or real. So that loss could be that somebody feels they've had a loss of respect or a loss of status in the workplace. They might be worried about a, a, a loss of uh, promotion, ultimately even a loss of job role if there are rest restructures uh, happening. So some more tips about managing conflict in teams. So it's important here to recognize that having conflict in a team, it's not a sign of failure. It is a normal part of team functioning. And it, and it can be a positive thing, conflict, because, because from conflict comes different ways of doing things, different ideas. So transforming conflict from it being dysfunctional to functional can make a team stronger. So if you have a team that is in conflict, asking for help from HR, uh, whether that's internal HR or an outsourced HR company uh, like ourselves at Clover or asking for help from another manager, it's not a sign of weakness because issues can be complex. So if you are looking to deal with conflict in a team, here are some tips. So first thing to do is listen to all the members of team in private individual meetings. Encourage each team member to tell you their story as in, what's happened, how are you feeling about it, what do you need to change, what can I do to support you, check how they're feeling and what they need to happen. In your role here it's important to avoid making judgments, tempting though that can be, it's really important to avoid making judgment and remain impartial. And then when you've had these individual meetings then bring the team together to discuss their concerns lead that meeting make sure everybody everybody has time to speak have they've got airspace so you might want to set some um some 
a contract almost at the beginning of that meeting about how it's going to work, that the people will have uninterrupted speaking time so that they can be heard in a safe, constructive and supportive way. In that meeting, create a future focus. So invite the team to explore what for them does a great team look like? To be a, continue to be a great team or to become a great team, what needs to happen tomorrow? As in what needs to change immediately? And how can they look to resolve their differences collaborator collaboratively? Remember that they have the responsibility here. You are helping them facilitate that. And then be clear about what your role you're going to play as a leader going forward. What you've learned from this situation. So be open and honest yourself if you're expecting other people to be. Set your own expectations and needs for the future of the team. And set out for the team your own goals and, and vision and inspire the team with that vision. And then wrap up the meeting positively and summarise agreed goals and objectives for the future of the team. And in doing all this, it will help to create an atmosphere of trust and people perform best when they work in an atmosphere of trust. They trust other people and they feel trusted themselves. So creating a culture which includes conflict management. So there's some key things here for, for companies and organisations. So ensuring job roles are clearly defined and objectives are clear, which goes back to the point we made before. So people have clarity about what their role is and what's expected of them and review it on a regular basis. Make sure there's ongoing uh, monthly conversations about that with the manager, however you want to structure those. And then train uh, your managers on communication and conflict management skills. Uh, and that training is freely available. We offer it here from Clover, um, but it, it, it is available to do. And embed, embed these regular review meetings. And those meetings need to be checking in, in on how people are feeling, as well as looking at their action points and their team objectives. Give space to ask those kind of questions, uh, especially in this current time. And encourage managers to get to know the teams um, to get to know them on a, on a personal level. And when you're managing change, ensure that the reasons for change are properly communicated so people are clear why the change has been introduced and what it is, and that this consultation takes place all through the process. And recognise how people, again, may be feeling about changes and acknowledge those feelings. They're a natural part of change. And recognise and deal with clashes that may occur between people about work completion or differences in beliefs and goals and have that conversation before there's an escalation because uh, this is the time to to deal with conflict in a positive way then consider training internal mediators or partner with an organization to arrange external mediation and incorporate mediation into your grievance policies. And again, we can I can advise about that. And we can advise about that from Clover HR. So in summary then, we've explored what is conflict. We've looked at conflict management styles and hopefully found that interesting and the key causes of conflict. We've considered what needs to be in place to create a culture which includes conflict management, which recognises conflict exists and we have ways of, of dealing with it so it, it remains constructive. So if you want to explore any of the issues that have been raised here, and, uh, and whether using an external mediator is right for your business, then please contact me. You can contact me by phone or email or contact Clover HR. I'd be more than happy to discuss your requirements. So if anyone has any questions, I can answer them now or you can contact me following this webinar. Uh, so again, thank you for listening. Uh, th these are my details. So uh, I hope you've, you've found it interesting. I'm just having a look here. I've not got any questions.
I'm just uh, having a look and I'm just going to unmute your microphones. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Who forgot there? Victoria. Oh, hiya, Victoria. Hiya. Uh, have you got any questions that you want to ask? The only observation really is that the different, um, uh, what did you call them, types of people can overlap. Yeah, absolutely. It's just really a kind of model to kind of, to try and identify some of the styles, but you're absolutely right. People don't fall generally just into one category. Some people it's more obvious than others. Is that what you were thinking? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Did you find that useful? Yeah, it was good. Ah, uh, good, good, good. It's, um, it's funny because when I started looking at conflict, uh, I can identify people that, that fall into different modes. Uh, of, of, and styles and I can actually identify my own as well so that, that's quite useful um, but I, I really do believe in all my years of, of HR experience that the most complex grievances and disciplines I've dealt with have been when people have been in conflict and it's been left till it's escalated mm, mm. yeah so um, yeah it's interesting um, is there anything else that you'd like to, to know about conflict or mediation? Uh, not at this moment, thank you. All right, thanks very much for, for attending. Thank you. Bye. Right. Okay, everybody, I'm going to sign off now. So thanks for attending. And again, if you've got any questions, then please do get in touch.